Okay, so we're starting. Yes, we are. <laughs> starting is always strange. Um, <laughs> Rima and I are here on a Friday afternoon, once again, well, it's almost afternoon, here at the Box of Books Library with our Grow Your Own series. And this time we're going to be talking about color in the garden, which really is going to be two parts, because you know me, it's not just going to be about how we use color in our garden, but since I was once upon a time a scientist and also taught art, um, I'm going to talk about how we see color what it is and how it affects how we see it. And that'll help us if we want to use color as a design part of our garden to know what we're doing. Um, but before we get there, I wanna mention the drought. I heard on the radio that Steuben County, which is right next to Allegheny County where we are, about a week ago was officially in a drought situation. Mm. Now I don't know what they mean by that. But I know what, as a gardener, I know what it means. You said your rhododendron bush was droopy. Oh, yes. Well, I have two lilac bushes that are about 10 years old. So they're pretty good size. And they're about 10 feet south of my vegetable garden. One directly below the vegetable garden, which I've been watering, maybe mm, every six days or so, trying to get an inch of rain. Uh, but the other one is just over by the lawn but in a row. And last night, I suddenly looked at that one to the side mm -hmm. and it was all, the leaves were all curling off. Right, yep. And I thought, wow, I have never seen that in 35 yep. years yep. here. We've had dry spells before and even droughts, but I don't ever remember the shrubbery doing that. Yeah, right. So I got out the hose and two lengths <laughs> with my nozzle stood there for about 20 minutes. And it could just, the arc could just reach it. So once again, if you're watering, it doesn't do any good to sprinkle it for five minutes. That'll do probably more harm than good. But definitely water it as well as you can. Um, you know, I've been taking putting about a gallon of water on the rhododendron every day. Yeah. And it's very happy now. Yes. Rhododendron in particular, are very shallow rooted. I so they are going to feel the effects of yeah. a dry spell much quicker yeah. than anything that is more deeply rooted. Mm -hmm. Same with your blueberries. They're mm -hmm. also shallow rooted. Mm -hmm. um, lilacs, I think, probably go down deeper. Um, but it's interesting. I have a maybe a 1% slope. So even though I wasn't watering the one lilac bush directly below the vegetable garden, 10 feet, there's the vegetable garden, a section of lawn, the lilac bush, there was enough slope that the water I was putting on my veggies, enough of it seeped down yeah. to that first yeah. lilac to yeah. keep it going. Yeah. So then I walked into my wildflower garden in the woods and the same problem, you know, mm -hmm. and some of them, it won't kill them, especially the ones that have tubers or bulbs or corms. Um, they won't be as floriferous next year if they die back sooner than they would otherwise. But there are some plants that I'm thinking. So I dragged the hose back through the woods <laughs> <laughs> and took about 45 minutes, once again, with the nozzle and a, and a narrow spray hitting just the plants that needed water. I'm not gonna water the whole floor of the woods. Yeah. So I'm seeing even the uh, ragweed is, ah, is wilting, which good. is incredible. <laughs> I know, I just, That's I good. think of that plant as being so tough that nothing yep. will bother it. but. Oh, by the way, we always have at this time of year, everybody, the ragweed has a, a blue, a, a yellowy green, tiny little flower that you don't even notice. What's blooming at the same time? The goldenrod. What gets blamed for hay fever? The ragweed. No, most people think it's the goldenrod. Oh, really? Which it isn't. <laughs> goldenrod does not give you hay fever. So, um, but the ragweed does, but that's less noticeable. All right. What else? Um, I keep track of on my hillside here in Alfred on the eastern side of Allegheny County um, from May on because I have a plastic gauge and I don't want it to freeze and bre one broke because I left it out over the winter like a dummy. So from May, June and July, we've had less than half the normal 
amount of rain for this area. And August is shaping up to be even worse. Yeah. So we're at least seven inches short. Wow. I don't know what the four winter months were because I didn't keep track. Right. Um, but starting in spring and May, we are a good seven inches behind, which is why things are beginning to really mm -hmm. feel it. So your veggie garden, an inch a week. Um, hopefully your well doesn't run dry. I know. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> well, yeah. you begin to realize how so many people in the world it's not a matter of just having a green lawn. Right. It's a matter of survival. Right. And people are literally in certain parts of the world where the drought has gone on now for four or five, six years. The cattle are all dead. Yeah. Um, kids are dying. Old people are dying. Yeah. And um, our water is a problem. I have a question that's yeah. related to that. Mm. So I'm getting ready to plant, to replant lettuce seeds. Ah, should I go ahead and do it now when it's so hot and dry or should I wait a week or Do you have weeks? a place that they're going to get shade in the afternoon or not? Not really. They'll, they'll be in the sun from, boy, probably eight o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. until six o'clock at night. That's all day. Yeah. Um, it's a, almost the middle of August, right? Yeah. It's the 12th. Well, in this day and age, who knows what's going to happen to the weather in a week, right? We could yeah. have a snowstorm as far as this crazy weather. Um, we're, I'm, we're getting off topic, but I it know. is interesting. Seoul in South Korea, the capital mm -hmm. in the northern part of South Korea, near the border with mm -hmm. North Korea, last week had, was it 19 inches of rain in like a day? Oh. And then four or five days later, they had another nine inches of rain. Twenty, I think a total of 23 inches of rain, all within four days. And this is happening more and more. Um, part of this consequences of climate change is that our weather patterns are changing and we're having humongous downpours right, over here extremes, yeah. and out in san diego where my one daughter lives it's i think the seventh year of a severe drought at least yeah. seven years yeah. so anyway um conserve your water folks we happen to live in a in, in a fairly safe place in the world as far as that goes but we're in the middle of a drought right now okay yeah so well, planting lettuce uh, what i would do is um in the evening I would would make my trench maybe a little deeper than you normally would for lettuce. Okay. A good half inch deep and soak it well with cold water from your hose. Okay. Then early in the morning, go out and sow your lettuce seeds. Cover them up with that half inch of damp soil. Okay. And then mulch it at least one inch with something fine. I need those ground up leaves. What have you got? I have pine needles. They're not ground up, though. Pine needles be fine. A good half, a good... Um, you know, the long... Yeah, the long ones. That's what I use. Okay. Um, maybe even almost up to an inch deep if you have it. Half inch to inch deep. You don't okay. want it so deep the poor little lettuce seed can't get through. Okay. Um, but you want to conserve the water that you've put in there yeah. and keep the ground cooler. Okay. Then what I would do is write, you know, maybe that's a four-inch band. So on either side of that, mulch it deeper. So once again, okay. you want to keep the surrounding ground as cool that as makes you sense. can. Okay. Because most lettuce is a 60 day thing. So that means probably by the end of September, you'll be able to start picking it, the baby stuff. Okay. Into October, you might have to toss some sheets depending once again on the crazy weather. But last year we didn't have a freeze 32 until around the middle of October. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, which is about two weeks longer than usual yep. now. Yep. Mm. Okay. All right, moving on <laughs> to all you people that, uh, oh, by the way, uh, one of our faithful attenders, um, Regina, is off with Mary Lou Cartledge on a wonderful, you know that, they, they're yeah. hopped the train and they're headed for the West Coast having an adventure. Mm -hmm. So I told them both at Bird Club the other night, take lots of pictures. <laughs> oh, but I'm not a good photographer. Doesn't matter. Take a lot of pictures because we want to see their adventures. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 
All righty, color in your garden. First of all, I'm going to admit it's totally subjective. Everybody that knows me knows I really don't like yellows, oranges, and reds, and I have very few of those in my garden. Some people love them. Some people love to plan their garden. Others just, I call it the willy-nilly, <laughs> plop it here, plop it there. Uh -huh. She's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my best friends are like that. I can't stand it, but that's me. It's a subjective thing. So, Rima, what kind of flowers, what kind of flowers do you grow? Any particular color or? Well, actually, right this year, because you were talking about nasturtiums, I planted uh, some nasturtiums. The yellow, and orange, red ones? bananas. They yes. Crazy. They are very, very happy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have yellow and orange and red uh -huh. in the garden. That's what I have right now. Those are the colors. Okay. Um, I think nasturtiums, if you look up their horticultural needs, and where they evolved in the world. I'm betting it. they love the hot and the dry uh -huh. and the sunshine. Oh, well, there you go. So there you go. It's the perfect year for them. Oh yeah. They're Some huge. things that like it more cool or cloudy or damp, I think mm -hmm. are doing very poorly or dying off. I'm trying to think if I have anything else blooming flowers but no I tried to, I tried to find some borage but I couldn't find any. Oh I wanted to plant borage. I forgot. I've got a plan for you. And I was going to dig it up and bring it. When, when are you working here again? Monday. Monday. I'll try and remember. It's about this high. Ooh. And it hasn't bloomed yet. You know, it was a self-sower. Oh. So once you have borage, you'll have it forever. Oh. But it's not easy to pull out. Okay. It's very easy to get rid oh, of great. the extra. That's All right. Great, Bill. Okay. Thanks. All righty. All righty. Um, we pull up on the screen during the... Last week, I left some of my papers with Rima, and she put them online. Is that what we say? You put them online? Is that the great way to say I actually put them on the computer. On the computer. Yes. So how are they going to see it? <laughs> I've already forgotten how I did Oh, share screen. Okay. Um, first. I would have practiced this, but I didn't know how to do it without actually getting into a Zoom. Oh, that's all right. If, if it weren't so for Rima, we know. wouldn't be doing this. You'd have to be here in the library, um, like in the old days when you sat around the campfire. <laughs> what we're going to do is look at the color wheel here in a minute that science has put together, artists have put together, um and which oh you wanted the color wheel the okay. color wheel first because we're going to come up with some definitions all righty and you probably if you had to suffer through an art class in like sixth or seventh or eighth grade make sure it's working okay yeah. <laughs> we could just be talking to the air here um you probably your art teacher brought this up the color wheel and what we do we have certain terms the yellow, the blue, and the red are considered primary colors, at least for artists. And that was because back in the day, before you could go to the art store and buy a hundred different kinds of blue, etc., you had to make your own colors. And so the artists would mix yellow and blue to get green, yellow and red to get orange, and red and blue to get purples. A little white made them lighter, a little black made them darker. And so with those three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, you can make them all. Um, so we have our primary colors, and then the ones that they mixed, the green, the purple, and the orange were secondary colors. And artists and scientists call color hue, H-U-E. The hue is yellow. They call it a hue rather than color. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. And if you add, say, some white paint, uh, Rima, to the red paint, what color paint do you get? Pink. Pink. And that's a tint. And I always tell my oh. art students, 
you tint your hair to make it blonde, uh, so make it lighter. But if you pull the shades to make the room darker, if you add black to the red, you might get a more of a deep, dark, dark red. Like burgundy or, or something. A shade. That's called a <sighs> shade of red. So when you're working in the garden, you're working with hues, colors. Seldom are they pure. Often they're shades and tints of either the three primary colors, red, yellow, blue, or the secondary, green, orange, and purple, or violet, maybe they call it, and everything in between. So that's the color wheel. Now, how we see. Rima did this test for me last week and she only got 50%. And I don't, so I don't to make her feel bad. So instead of saying normal eyes, I'm gonna say average eyes, which I think is a better term anyway. So Rima, can we pull this that one up on the okay. screen first? All righty. Um, if you look at this flat piece of paper that has a blue background and then a red circle, if you stare at it, I to tell it that it's... which seems to be closer to you? Is the red floating in front of the background or is it somehow sinking behind the background? And Rima, you had this one correct as far as the average eye. What did you say for this one? Do you remember? Yeah, the red. The red definitely seems to be closer to you, floating in front of that blue background. Oh. It's kind of weird. So it says that I'm screen sharing this. Oh, you're, it, you're reverberating over there. You should mute yourself. You seem to be having some technical difficulty. So if anybody out there is listening to this, I'm not sure if you can see this at this point, but Rima, can we switch the image or are we not even broadcasting? Um, can we switch the to the other page or not? Are, are they being able to see it if anybody's out there? We don't know. Apparently not, which is odd because this is telling me that it is. It says you are screen sharing. Huh. Well, let's switch the images. Okay. Let's see. I need to move this over. Because it's back here. No, no. We jumped ahead. Well, Rima works with that. <laughs> um, there we are. What we're going to see eventually, I assume, is a red background with the blue circle. And when we get to that, uh, there we go. Now, most people will see that. Where did it go? <laughs> As there we go. There's a hole in the red paper, and behind it is the blue. Now. What, this is the average eye. We'll see things this way. Why is that physiologically? In a few minutes, we're going to talk about color and wavelengths. And every color we see, blue or red or whatever, comes to our eyes in a different wavelength. And it just so happens that the human eye the red wavelength focuses slightly, slightly in front of your retina. So it seems closer to you. Whereas the blue wavelength, which is shorter, focuses slightly behind your retina and therefore seems further away hmm. to you. So it's a physiological reason for why it seems <coughs> closer or further away. <coughs> now, how we see, and I didn't think to have Rima look this up online, but I just had the assistant Claire do it for me because I always get them mixed up. In our eyes are cones and rods. And I finally figured out a way to keep them straight. The cones are in the center of your eye, the pupil of your eye, your retina. <coughs> And they're what sees color, C, C, C. The cones in the center see the color. And we need daylight to see color. If anybody uh, has gone down into a deep, dark cave, 
Rima, have you ever gone into a deep, dark cave when they turned all the lights off? Oh, yes. And you don't see a thing, do you? Mm -mm. Not a thing. Totally pitch black. So in order to see anything, including color, you need to have light, either from the sun, natural light, or indoor light of one sort or another. Um, the cones of our eyes, which function mostly in the daytime, in fairly bright light, that see color, also see things very sharply. If you've ever, um, as a matter of fact, I didn't think of this, we could do an experiment. I'm gonna have Rima do an experiment. Don't look at this. I have a colored pen in my hand. I don't want you to look, shut your eyes for a minute. Okay. Give me your hand, take the pen in your hand, hold it straight out here and I'll move out of the way. You can open your eyes. Now slowly swing your arm around until you register the color of the pencil. Okay. All right. But you could see it out here, right? But you, there was, mm -hmm. but there was no color. Mm -hmm. oh. <clears throat> That's because the rods, which are on the periphery of your eye, do not detect color. They function in dusk and the dark. Oh. So you had to swing the pen around till the cones could catch the color. Huh. I had a student once that cheated. He knew the color of the pencil. And I, and I knew he had to have cheated because you just can't see the color when it's 90 degrees out there. So another student gave him a pencil that he didn't know what the color was. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course you get to that angle. All right, I hadn't thought of that. Um, an experiment you could do is at dusk, um, maybe 15 minutes after the sun goes down. So that's around eight o'clock at night, sit somewhere in your living room where you have some bright furniture maybe a red couch or a painting on the wall with a yellow something or other. And as don't turn the lights on and you can't do this in the town or the city where there's street lights and whatnot. You have to be out in the country where when it gets dark, it gets dark. And just sit in your darkening room for about 20 minutes to a half hour and see when you can no longer see the color of the couch mm. or the painting. And it's the same thing as with the pen. As the light fades, our cones become inactive and we don't right. see color anymore. Because we can definitely see the shapes. But you see the that. shapes and you and the and then the peripheral rods are picking up and they function in the dimmer light. But it's all gray, shades of yeah. gray, yeah. light and dark gray. So all right. Um, now, don't have a bit. Color is energy, you could say, and it comes in wavelengths. I'm sure you all remember Roy G. Biv. <laughs> Who's that? Who's Roy G. Biv? Mr. Rainbow. Mr. Oh, I never heard it said that way. Yes, Mr. Rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, our eyes can see those seven colors, is it? Yeah. However, the infrared range, which is slight, the, the red has longer wavelengths and the blue, violet, shorter. On the infrared, if you keep going, we can't see it. But what are night goggle visions? Do you know? Have you ever thought about that? What do you mean, what are they? How do they work? <clears throat> oh, the, and oh. the soldier is wearing night goggle yeah, visions. I know what they Why? Do, but yeah, I don't know how they work. Yeah. They basically pick up infrared rays, okay. which is body heat. So you can be hiding in the desert in the dark and they can't see you, but the infrared rays are still radiating out from your body and those goggles will pick that up and they know where you are. So that's at that end. On the other end of the Roy G. Biv, the violet end is ultraviolet. That's what gives you the sunburn. Mm. You can't see it, but the bees can see it. Mm. They see ultraviolet as a color. And when we, um, well, why don't I just talk about it now? We are looking, say, I don't know, I can't give a specific example. Let's say a daisy type flower. All the little um, real flowers are in the middle. And then you have these beautiful petals, mm -hmm. white or yellow or whatever color they are. To us, it would be all white or all yellow. But if you had bees eyes and could see into the ultraviolet, you would see landing strips down <clears throat> those petals right to the center of the flower where the nectar is. Hmm. Yes, I, I think that's so. We have 
Yeah. Lilies. I was just okay. picturing the, the lilies, you know, those day lilies mm -hmm. that are orange. Yeah. And I see bees go in there all the time. So mm -hmm. they're, is that what they're doing? They're finding um, the, because they, they sometimes right to the middle. I think sometimes it's smell. Uh, but once again, I'm not an expert on etymology, but sometimes I think it's smell. Sometimes it's color. Um, when we get into using, well, I'll just mention it now. Uh, bees tend to be attracted to the blue and purple flowers. What are hummingbirds like? I was just going to say they like red, don't they? Red. Because they love those. And butterflies like um, yellow and, well, when I get to it, yellow and something else. Um, maybe yellow and red. I have that elsewhere in my talk. What about orange? Okay, well, that would probably be in with the yellow and the red is my guess. Yeah, I'm just picturing butterflies going around orange, mm -hmm. orange bushes. Okay. All right. Um, but we'll get back to that. That's I'm getting out of order here. <laughs> um, now, how we see these wavelengths, these energies. Um, now, you're wearing a blue dyed dress. All righty. Or perhaps you're growing, what, what's a blue flower that you can grow in your garden? A violet. Are they blue or are they purple? That's true. They're, they're purple. But that would be okay. Um, chicory is very chicory. good. Chicory. Good idea. Okay. Chicory blue. Now, there's such a thing as a pigment. A pigment is a chemical that will absorb certain wavelengths. So here you have your sunlight, which, by the way, hides Roy G. Biv, right? You have to go back to old Newton, and because Newton, he was teaching, I think, at some London university when the play came back in the 1500s, I think, was Newton? It was either 1600s. I can never remember. But the plague didn't just come once. It came back off again over the years. Yep. And sounds sound like COVID. They closed down the university. So he had to go home to his estate. There he is, a bright man, nothing to do. <laughs> Started experimenting, and remember, the prism the beam of light, oh, the rainbow. And he came up with this theory about light traveling in wavelengths as a, as a bundle of white light from the sun. But if you can somehow rake it up mm. into its individual component wavelengths, you had red Roy G. Bev, always. And then, <laughs> if you somehow take that rainbow's light and run it through another prism, it reverses it and you get your white light again. I think that's true. Um, you're all free to check it online and correct <laughs> me next week if I goof up on anything. Because sometimes um, I don't always remember things absolutely correctly. So, getting back to our pigments. And our flowers that have pigments in their petals. Here comes this beam of white light. And somehow, and we go, won't go into it, it's all chemistry and physics and too complicated for this talk. Let's just say the blue pigment has the ability to absorb all those wavelengths in Roy G. Biv, except oh. the blue, which is reflected, <laughs> bounced back to our eye. And since then, that's the only wavelength we see. It looks blue. Now, much of nature, much of art with paints or dyes or people with brown eyes, that's how we see the color. Everything else in the spectrum is absorbed. And the only thing left to reflect back like a mirror to our eye is one wavelength. However, there is another way of seeing color, which I find Quite fascinating. Now we have a hummingbird here, and once again, did you have that on the screen somewhere? Yes. There's a this is bird. not a hummingbird you'd see in America. I don't believe you'd have to go to Central or South America, and I'm sorry I don't have the name anymore of it. Um, but we can also think of bluebirds, and I, maybe I should have gotten images of this also. But you, you've all seen a bluebird. Or that famous morph blue butterfly from Brazil. An absolutely gorgeous, somewhat like this, more blue than blue-green, um, absolutely gorgeous butterfly. To understand how we see this, because if you are a bird watcher, 
and you're looking at a bluebird, it doesn't always seem blue. Mm -hmm. That's true. Sometimes it's just dark, almost blackish gray. And if you ever stop to, if you have a curious mind, now when is it when it's blue? You, after a while of observation, you realize you, the bird, and the sun all have to be in a certain triangle with each other. The sun has to strike the bluebird's feathers at a certain angle to our eye to see the blue. So what the heck is going on there? Well, I'm going to take you to a lake in the summertime. Have you ever gone water skiing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you take off. Your boat's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. It's going pretty fast. It's making a big wake. But you're safe in the middle of the wake, right? As I recall, I only tried this once. I got up and it was like, it was like skiing. Oh my God, how do I get down? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't have any trouble getting down. Oh, didn't you? Okay, oh, no, I, I only I went. fell over all the you time. You fell over. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. A smaller boat is going to make smaller wakes, right? Mm -hmm. Less going less fast. What happens if those two motorboats wakes cross each other? The one is big wakes, the other one's smaller. What is what's left behind? You ever think about that or notice it or no? I'm trying to remember because I know I I'm sure that happened. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was just a lot of frothing water. Ah, okay. Either they cancel themselves out and the water becomes much calmer okay. or they um, enhance each other and the weight gets rougher. That's more what I remember. Okay. Yes. So you want to avoid that. <laughs> yes, indeed. I, yes. All right. I'm so here we have light waves and we can sometimes think of them as water waves up and down, up and down. Um, when a single beam of sunlight strikes something that will when it passes through whether it be a tiny 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 sphere that's clear or feathers arranged in very thin pat, uh, patterns one on top of another or the butterfly wings has scales that easily rub mm -hmm. off on your fingers mm -hmm. if you're stupid enough to rub their wings um all of this basically takes that one beam. It's sort of like what happens when you stick a pen in a glass of water. You know, the, the pen breaks and you, you've done that, right? No. <laughs> oh, she, when she goes home tonight, the first I thing will. she's going to do is fill up a glass of water <laughs> and stick a straw or whatever in it. And that's why if you've never hunted fish with a spear, Beginners always miss oh. because the fish is never where you think it yes, is. I have tried to oh, you've that. tried that Not with a real honest to God spear, but you know, when you're a kid, Did you, you ever catch them? around. Oh no. No, that's because you didn't know what happened. Yeah. The, um, refraction, yeah. bending of the light when it goes from one density air to water, a different density <laughs> or through the feathers or the spheres. You try to grab a fish, you know, same thing. Kid, you yeah. Try to, oh yeah. 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 Okay. Well, now she will all learn something new. Um, <laughs> watch out, fish. Now we know <laughs> how to get you. Um, so that refracting um, goes through, hits the back wall, say, of the bubble, is bounced back like it was a mirror. But in doing all of that, it's bending. And so it's like interference of the waves. When it comes back out to your eye, the original color has been lost wow. and whatever wavelength happens to come back out to your eyes, the color you see. Hmm. Hmm. So things like iridescent and the glimmer in an opal ring and the feathers on some birds, not all birds, but often the blue ones and um, butterflies, especially the blue ones, it's all due to interference not pigments and then the third way we see and this is i always i'm a bit of a philosopher so when i taught this i used to really love it um i'd have a student go up to the blackboard with an orange um 
marker and a, no, a red and a yellow marker. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have drawn a circle and I told him to fill up the circle with all these dots of yellow and red. And then I asked him to go to the back end of the room and look at what he had done and tell me what's the color. You want to guess, Neva? And uh, Neva. Rima. I have a friend. Orange. Neva. Yeah, he'd go to the back of the room and he'd look at what he had done, the yellow and red dots, and say, Well, it's orange. And I said, Really? Where'd the orange come from? Come back up and look. Can you find any orange? And he'd come back up and he'd look at his yellow and his red dots and he'd say, I don't know where it went. And I said, are you sure you saw it? <laughs> he said, yes, I saw it. <laughs> so anyway, that's what is called optical mix. And it's the optic nerve in your eye. When you have lots of little dots in art, it was called pointillism. And the, some Frenchmen discovered how to use it. Surat, for instance, and um, Pizarro a little bit. Um, and they would put a bunch of usually complementary Yellow and red is a complementary color. Mm. And we would see the secondary color as we back off. So in nature, there is very, very, very few things that are pure gray. Almost everything that we see in nature that's gray is an optical mix of black and white, which when I first read that, I thought, mm. that's really interesting. <clears throat> and for the life of me, uh, I think lead, gray lead is one thing that's gray gray i was thing. thinking of some gray birds but i think doves i think we'll check it afterwards and you can check it if you're listening to this i think doves are an optical mix of black and white but maybe the dove was one of four things that was really gray so we're huh. going to leave that question up in the air till later because off the top of my head i don't remember and all righty those are all the scientific ways that we see color but there's also properties of color. And one is, can we go to the, um, well, we're gonna, can we put both up at the same time, smaller or not? Or they have to be I one can try of, of you these. Can, yeah. Let's see what happens. Hmm. There's one. And there's the other. Well, we can just bounce back and forth. We don't have to see them at the same time. Let's leave this one up for now. Whoops. We'll back up. It's going to go <laughs> everywhere except where we want. OK. We um, can divide up the color that we see in the garden. Well, we add it. We'll get it. There we go. <laughs> well, I have to tell it to share screen. Oh, it's see? sharing the screen. Yes, oh, okay. To, that's what I figured out. Okay. I have to Are we them. now sharing yes. the screen? All we right. Now sharing the screen. This group of flowers in the top left-hand corner, I, I quite enjoyed cutting up my, my magazines and <laughs> making this collage years ago. Um, we consider this end of the um, color wheel as warm colors. Mm -hmm. Now, why don't we flip then to that um, other bunch of pictures? Yeah, that one. There. Whoops. Whoa. Well, I thought <laughs> I thought I had a quick way. There to we do go. It, but All righty. The lower we're getting there. We're getting there. The lower a series of flowers which um, we'll talk there. about monochromatic in a bit. All the blues and the purples and the lavenders, they're considered cool colors. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had a bunch of the warm and then a bunch of the cool, and they were in the same situation, either the sun or the shade or the whatever, and I stuck a thermometer in each group, it would be the same. Oh, okay. Why am I calling one warm colors and one cool? You wanna make a guess? They make you feel either warmer or cooler. Why? Because the sun is warm and it's orange yeah. and yeah, red and yes. yellow. And what did you, in the old days when you had a fireplace or oh, yeah. even the old, old days when it was just a campfire? Mm -hmm. Okay, fire warm. and the sun, it, 
ever since you're two years old and you touch the red hot stove, <laughs> you connect red with hot. What about the cool colors? What's cool? Water. What's, water? Why don't we go swimming in the summertime into the deep blue sea? Or the winter, the snow, oh, yeah. especially at dusk, yeah, takes on that blue the sheen. blue. Yeah. Okay. Nighttime is dark, dusky. Green, also cool forest. Yes. Walking out of the sun. Green would cool. also, I would put that into a cool, mm -hmm. cool part. So where are my notes? So we have psychological. Mm. Then we have <laughs> physical. And we, you, you have to remember, we're not make Rima go back to the red <laughs> circle in front of the blue. Um, let's say you live in the town and you have a very small backyard and you want to fill it with flowers. And it's only 50 feet deep, maybe 20 wide, but you want to give the illusion of depth. Or if you're a painter and you're hmm. painting a crowd, and once again, besides perspective, you want to give the illusion that the crowd fills up the, the field. What colors would you use to enhance that illusion? Going back to our red and blue circles, what seems closer and what seems further away? The red seems closer. Okay, the red seems closer. I forget if it was Bruegel who liked to do crowd scenes back in the 1500s, um, but he could apply this. The kids playing in the front of mm -hmm. the huge um, plaza would be wearing red uh -huh. and the kids uh -huh. in the back would have a blue hat <clears throat> or a blue jacket. In your garden, the red colors would be right near your back door, your terrace, whereas in the back fence, 50 feet away, you'd plant your blue spectrum flowers because once again, you tend to see blue as being further away, even though it isn't. And you tend to see the red is closer. So that would, the illusion would stretch out your yard and make it seem longer. Huh. That's the theory anyway. All righty. Um, the other physical thing that affects the properties of your plants is the, amount, the kind of light that they are getting and the temperature. Obviously, in the morning and the late in the day, the sun is low in the sky. Mm -hmm. And so it's coming through a lot more of our atmosphere. The same is true early in the year when the sun is lower at noontime and then gradually until June gets higher and higher. So depending on the time of the day and the season of the year, the type of sunlight that's going to be striking your flowers is going to be different. Also, the temperature differs through the day mm -hmm. and through the seasons. Now, I think both of these affect especially the color blue and the blue morph butterfly, now that I think about it. The blue, I'll start with the blue morph butterfly. That's one of the early, early butterflies that shows up like in, mm, even in late in April sometimes. And they're not very big at the most an inch. And they tend to be pale blue and silvery blue on the um, backside of their wings. They usually have three, what do we call it? Hatches? Batches, whatever. <laughs> they, they have three- Hatchings? Hatchings, let's say, throughout the year spring, summer, and fall. Mm. The ones in the spring and the fall will be much bluer than the ones in the heat of summer when the sun is higher and hotter. The same is true of your blue flowers. Now, I used to grow Crystal Palace, which is a beautiful, pretty dark blue um, arboretia. No, mm. Lobelia, Lobelia. Yes, Lobelia, a slow growing flower. And I noticed um, at late in the day and at dusk, it looks much bluer than it looked in the middle of the day. You could check that if you have. The other thing is the higher up in the mountains you go 
altitude, elevation, your blue flowers will be more intense, yes. higher, with the air is thinner, and the ultraviolet is stronger. Um, so <coughs> all of these, time of day in the season, the blue will be darker um, in the twilight and in the spring and in the fall. The other thing is contrast properties. Um, I forget if it was in the 40s or the 50s. And she had a funny name, a British lady. I'm not even gonna, Sissenhurst is her family estate, I believe. <clears throat> and she designed the first white garden, which became all the rage around hmm. Europe and in America, um, where she tried to plant a garden that would be basically viewed at night, especially on moonlit nights. And it was all white. And so I had fun with this. And did I write down somewhere? Um, yes, I did. If I were designing a white garden. And by the way, I went with the master gardeners up to, uh, what's that big mansion up in Canandaigua? Stonenberg Gardens or Sonnenberg Gardens. And I was really, really, really disappointed. They don't have the money to take care of it. Mm -hmm. They don't have labeling in their perennial gardens. And as far as I was concerned, I could have done a much better job designing their white garden than they did. I was really, really disappointed. Mm. They went with easy stuff and it wasn't beautifully maintained. So anyway, if I were doing it, here's what I would plant. Um, for trees, now that we're getting warmer here, we can start growing dogwood trees. Oh, you know, they really never took here. The, no. the regular, regular dogwood dogwoods. <coughs> no, white, I think of them as Southern. Yeah, like well, my, my they were in Pennsylvania. They were, they were zone five, and we oh. were always a zone four in the old days. Oh. So, but anyway, dogwoods, white crab apples, oh, yeah. and then moving to shrubbery, white lilacs, bridal wreath, mock orange, which smells beautifully, and then moving to plants, peonies, iris, phlox, they all come in white versions, lily of the valley, if you either can contain it or don't mind it taking over the world. <laughs> um, and, and focus on silvery gray leaves seem mm. to enhance that white look. I have a barberry juniper, which only grows about six inches high, silvery gray green in the summer, a plum gray in the winter after the frost. Um, I'd use white gravel for my paths. I'd mm -hmm. paint my benches white. And then because you don't want a spotlight to ruin the effect, maybe some little fairy lights here and there, huh. or a single white torch here or there, uh, maybe underneath the crab apple tree or something. But um, I've had fun designing gardens like this. So a white garden is a monochromatic garden. We'll get to those in a minute, but it's basically one hue. Alrighty, what did I miss? Okay, use in the garden. We we're talking about how we can use color in the garden. Another one is green. Now, if you think about it, Rima, from April to October, our garden is gonna be filled with green leaves of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the flowers, unless it's annuals and you keep them deadheaded and they sometimes can flower all summer long, but they're perennials two to four weeks at the most, usually, and then you're left with the leaves. So I sometimes think, you know, I would say 95%, if not 99% of people, when they're planting a garden, they go for the flowers, the colors. Yeah, yeah. But you're really stuck with the leaves all six months out of the year, or maybe all year round if they're evergreen. So you need to consider the leaves. And I think the Japanese have a wonderful aesthetic where, um, Green, what do you think of when you think of green? If you walk into a green space, whether it's a woods or a planned garden, what do you, how, how do you respond to that, Neva? I don't know why I'm calling you Neva today. I have a friend named Neva. Oh, um, cool, calm. Cool, calm. Maybe if you wanted to have a um, garden for meditating, mm -hmm. like in the Islamic world and in the Japanese world, that was a big thing, a place to go to sit and think. Can you imagine that? You leave your cell phone and smartphone at the door and you're just left with your brain. Oh my. 
Okay, um, it's foliage six months out of the year. Maybe it will flower um, for a month. Um, moss and ferns, those are very ancient, primitive, primarily evil plants. Mm -hmm. I think they go back 400 million years. That's a long time. I think sometimes if you want to sit and contemplate life, it has, it's good to have a perspective. <laughs> what are we humans after 400 million years? Not even a dot on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay, so green is restful. Um, I also think we evolved in a forest. About 10 million years ago, before we stepped out, onto two feet and started walking the savannas of East Africa, open grasslands with mixed woodlands. We were a creature of the forest, the jungle, whatever it was. I don't think it was necessarily a jungle, but a forest. We were surrounded by green, which is why I think, and I've never read this anywhere, Roy G. Biv. Why is G in the middle? <laughs> because Originally, that's what all that's what we saw. Green was all around us in the early days of our evolution. And maybe it was important to be able to distinguish between different shades of green. And when you were leaping from one branch to the other, to have that in sharp focus so you didn't miss. Because if you missed, you would be dropped out of the gene pool <laughs> and your particular um, Roy G. Biv wouldn't be the same. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it makes sense to me. You know what else? Green what? is the only color I can think of that actually has a scent. Like when you think of green, there's if somebody says it smells green, there's a green smell like green, like freshly mown grass. Mm -hmm. You know what they mean. You know what they mean by that scent of green. Whereas if somebody says something about smelling red, red roses, roses, yes, but just red, just the color red. That's that, interesting. That means nothing to me. Mm -hmm. But green. If you also can green, smell the smell rain like... when the, if the rain just begins mm -hmm. like it did two nights ago, mm -hmm. I think. And it's just a mist really, mm -hmm. but instantly you can smell yes. that damp either on the road or the stones or the grass. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, maybe that's because we surround ourselves in our culture with lawns. I'm not sure yeah, a desert be... culture would have that yeah. sense. Yeah. That's true. They might smell dust. Yep. Different they kinds might of smell dust. Yellow. yellow, orange. Huh. All right. Some more questions for people who are curious. All righty. Um, where am I? Ta -da. Okay. Different kinds of color schemes. The monochromatic is you basically take one hue, one color. In this case, it was blue, and you add white or you add dark black, and you get the lighter and the darker. Um, strictly monochromatic. If you start playing with purple, you know, and green, then, then that's something else. <laughs> so some people really enjoy this. They take red and pinks and, you know, light red, dark red, all the way down mm -hmm. to pale, pale pink. Um, or the blues are famous, I think quite famous. Uh, when I used to do a survey of my classes, of course it was only 30 people or so, Almost always the majority, blue was their favorite color for whatever reason. We tried to figure out why that is. And so few people ever, well, I just like it. But they never try and figure out why. And I'm sure there are cultural reasons for that. Hmm. And I'm, I would bet if you went to China, it wouldn't be blue. It might be red, but I'm not sure. So monochromatic, uh, um, they tend to be calming you know, if you have a, a huge garden and and monochromatic colors tend to do well in dapple shade for some reason or a light shade, um, they tend to be calming. They're subtle. Um, and then we move, we'll have to switch now back to that other page, analogous colors. And once again, if you go to the color wheel. Do you want the color wheel or do you want? No, well, this Let's guy. first look at my example, and then we can go to the color wheel. Okay, the top corner, they were all anal analogous. And then let's go to the color wheel, because basically what you do is you make a 90 degree angle. 
you know, a right angle. And anything that in the center of the, the angle is in the center of your color wheel. Yeah, and so anything within 90 degrees would be considered analogous. So it'd be there we go. yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, orange, red. Well, that's a little more than 90 degrees. Um, or yellow, yellow, green, green, blue, green, they would all be analogous. In other words, I call them, I suddenly thought when I was rewriting in my notes, they're like cousins. You know, they're not direct. Mm. Like uh, if you take blue and add white and black, that's like having children, you know, sons and daughters of the blue parent. The others are more like cousins, come from a rela mm -hmm. uh, related close families. Um, some people like to go that direction. And then number five, we have to go back to our picture, complementary colors. Now they're not used as often. And in painting, um, Vincent van Gogh's golden orange wheat fields with the blue skies would be an example. So I have three color combinations on the bo bottom there that are considered complementary. And what they are is opposites on the color wheel. If you take yellow, purple is across from it or a violet, which is a mixture of the red and the blue, which were the two other primary colors. So in a sense, you have all the color. If you mix in colors, you'd have your red, yellow, and blue all in that combination, purple. And the same is red and green. And the same is, um, what's this? Orange and purple, mm -hmm. orange and blue rather, orange and blue. Now. When we do that, thinking back to the pointillism with dots, when we have the two wavelengths from opposites on the color wheel hitting our retina, it excites some inner, something in the optic nerve. And we're seeing then a painting that no longer seems flat and still. It seems to come alive and scintillate or waver or move around. Um, and the same thing in the garden. It catches your eye if you put um, mm, red poppies against a really some, I don't know, some kind of plant, uh, rubber plant or something that has big dark green leaves. And then you've got red yes. poppies popping up between. Well, red. that's one of the reasons I think the nasturtiums are so bright. Because ah. at least in my garden, because there's this wall of green behind them. Okay. And they just, yeah, they just yep. pop right out at pop you. Pop right out and see. Okay. Really pretty. Um, all right. Um, and I actually saw this once. Um, it was up at the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, and it was on the second floor. And I forget what the room, I think it was like European paintings from the 1800s, roughly. And it was a room probably as big as this library altogether and twice as wide. But the room was fairly dim. But some of the paintings had a little more light shining on them. And there across the room was one of Renoir's painting of the Thames River with the bridge over it, I think. And he used this technique of the color contrast, which he wasn't really noted for, but for some reason in that, or maybe it was a Seurat painting. That would, you know, that would make more sense. I think it must have been a Seurat painting because Renoir didn't do this. It was pointillism. And that painting just leapt off the wall. Hmm. It was like there was real water there and it was really moving hmm. and it was sparkling in the sunlight. So once again, a sub somewhat subjective, but not really. It was a physical response. Now, what was I gonna say about, um, well, okay. Um, planting, how are we doing on time? This is turning out to be a long lecture. Are we over? Yeah. Well, we're going to continue. So too bad. Got to spend more time planting. Um, in general, you plant in communities. Everything that likes the sun goes into a bed where there's sunshine all day. If they um, like it damp or shady, it has to go somewhere else. You don't want to put a sun-loving, dry-loving plant like um, um, lavender 
on the north side of your house with your ferns in the shade. You will kill it. It will hate you. It will die on you. Um, in, if you want to extend the joy of your garden, especially viewing it from a window, and it's winter here, still four months out of the year, five, you want to have some evergreens in your garden. That would look wonderful in the winter, especially with the dusting of snow. Um, if you enjoy, if you work all day and you come home and you only have the evening to enjoy your garden, or maybe you want to entertain, especially with this COVID thing still lingering, <laughs> outdoor dinner parties on your mm -hmm. patio, then maybe you want to plant a white garden. Mm -hmm. Thinking in terms of that, you know, it's going to be dusk, early evening. It, it, it'll show up beautifully. Um, I'm going to have to back up for a minute because I forgot something. We don't want to forget this. Back to um, different ways of, you know, planting, using color. The other is a theme. Now, I remember after 9-11, the next year, all the garden catalogs had new combinations of flowers that they encouraged you to buy in groups. And they were petunias. Guess what colors after 9-11? <laughs> Red and orange, no. yellow. No, patriotic colors. Oh, <laughs> red, white, and blue, which up until 9-11, the next year, gardeners didn't plant mostly red, white, and blue stuff together. Yeah, it doesn't sound. And all of a sudden, right. you saw these circles in the front lawns all over the country, usually petunias because they're easy to grow, and they're out there in the trade, red, white, and blue ones. Mm. Okay. Here in Alfred, what are the colors? Oh, yellow and purple. Yellow and purple. And I hope. Gold, helped, sorry. Gold uh, and purple. Gold and purple. All right. Yes. And I helped the lady whose um, father in law ha had a beautiful borders, but mostly, um, and he, he has since passed away and they've inherited the garden, um, mostly yellow and dark purple yep. flowers in them. Because he taught here. It's a very pretty combination. You know. Yeah, it is. Well, it's one of those. Um, is that a complimentary right? color, right? Yellow across yellow. The, uh, yeah, well, right. yellow and violet. Well, let me look at my wheel. What's across? Yeah, yellow and violet. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, sorry about that. I forgot the theme stuff. Back to th thinking about, okay, here it is. Butterflies seem to be attracted well, um, to yellow and purple flowers. Oh. That doesn't mean, now just, okay. I was out in my garden this morning and a fritillary floated by and it went briefly to the lavender phlox that I have. Um, hummingbirds are notorious for, if it's a choice, they'll go to the red. They like also tubular flowers because they yes. have the long sure tongue that can go into the two. Yeah. And bees seem to like the blue, violet, and purple. Although once again, I've seen bees everywhere including clo white clover mm -hmm. okay yes. um so when you're thinking about planting either redoing an old garden or starting out new is it a sunny or a shady spot is it a dry or a wet spot and don't forget the ph everybody forgets the ph <laughs> if you want to grow say a shrub border for some reason of azaleas and rhododendron if you don't check your ph and adjust it to make it more acid you won't be successful probably then you may want to consider a color scheme or not <laughs> depending on your psychological approach um, but you do i think want to consider time of bloom um, Yes. One of the ways we plant flower beds is called the herbaceous border. Mm -hmm. And it's been around for centuries and especially popular in England. And that is anywhere from three to five, say, feet wide. And however long you want to make it, let's say 20 feet. And often you have a fence behind it or a hedge behind it. And when you plant it, you should 
plant the tall things at the back right from where you you know and the middle stuff in the middle and the short stuff in the front because then when you look at it you'll be able to see everything i think that makes common sense and so i say you should let's not put the tall stuff hiding all the little stuff right the hollyhocks in front. yeah the hollyhocks <laughs> in front so you can't see the back of the, of the border uh, but you also should consider the time of bloom now if you're careful about it you can have blooms now from almost March mm. through October. Do you want everything blooming at this end of the border all at once? <laughs> or do you want to somehow scatter it throughout the length of the border? Mm. But then, okay, so you have to, cons that takes a bit of research. Mm -hmm. What blooms when? Um, and then this, most landscape designers agree with me. Limit your varieties. Otherwise, you have a hodgepodge. You plop one thing here, another thing here, you keep going, and you have 50 things in your 20 foot border, and there's no sense of pattern or design mm -hmm. or repetition. It's just, I'm a, um, an, arbore uh, an arboretum that isn't about trees but about flowering plants and i have one of every kind that will grow here in allegheny county as a scientific specimen not interested in design or beauty or anything just okay so you really have to bite the bullet and say mm, if it's only 20 feet long how many different kinds of things do i want and then how am i going to plant them we some that have gone down to Virginia, Williamsburg, is it the colonial? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. You'll see a line of tulips, just like soldiers marching down along the edge of that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want in your herbaceous border? Rigidity? Or do you somehow want a more natural mm -hmm. feel to it? Once again, that's a bit. Um, subjective mm -hmm. psychological mm -hmm. but once again the suggestion is from a long tradition coming from england is that you group your plants i think in japan also three to five if you're laying out a japanese garden of stones it's three to five stones god forbid the ignorant person that puts in six stones <laughs> or six plants <laughs> or whatever so once again three to five no plop plop and you have repetition. You don't have all of your Shasta daisies here. Right. You maybe make, if it's 20 feet long, maybe you want to have three sections that repeat the pattern, whatever that pattern is. Um, or sometimes, a single species can be quite beautiful over a large area, if you have a large area. Um, I happen to have a part of my land is a 10 acre meadow. And I didn't realize this, I found out later, up on the, let's see, southeast corner, about one acre, for some reason, in, in late, let me think, late May, early June, that whole section comes up it's, it's not, there's grasses in there and other things, but the dominant plant is the Dane's Rocket, that beautiful white lavender pink um, wildflower mm. that we don't usually see at my elevation over 2000 feet. But if you go down towards Hornell, as soon as you get down to around 1500 feet, it's all along the creeks and the sides of the roads. And it's, it blankets the edges oh, of yeah, the road. Beautiful. Yes, it's from England and it's not flocks. Most people think it's flocks. Um, that just covers that whole acre. Mm. And it's quite beautiful yeah, and the, be and the butterflies love it. Mm. Well, I turned out, it turns out that years ago before I bought the land, so I'm saying 50 years ago, um, the owner allowed the village from Alpha Station or so, lower elevation, dump you know, they clean up creek, street, uh, creek beds and whatnot, um, dump that there. And with it came the Dane's Rocket. Oh, yeah. And once it was brought, it, it, it stayed. But normally it's not huh. this high up. Huh. So that's quite beautiful. 
Um, and of course, in August, an old field that is not being maintained as a hay field, maybe mowed once a year to keep the trees at bay. Goldenrod will start moving in. Now we call it a weed, but actually if you look, go to England and look in their garden catalogs, it's sold as a perennial, hmm. sought after perennial. People buy goldenrod in England to plant in their garden because they think it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So those would be two examples of um, a single species kind of taking over an environment that they're well suited to. They like the soil and the moisture and the wind direction and the amount of sun and the cold and whatnot. And so they gradually take over. So that is my long talk on <laughs> using color in your garden. Well, thank you, Mary Lou. Okay. Like that. Mm -hmm.